What you have just listened to was the last known transmission from 20-year-old pilot Frederick Valentich before a Cessna 182 plane disappeared over the Bass Strait in Australia in 1978. 45 years later, his plane and body have never been found. Welcome back to the last episode of our Halloween specials here on Shadow Matter, where over the month of October, I have been retelling some of the more horrific and strange stories from Australia, and doing so while wearing some funky looking masks. Today's episode is the mysterious disappearance of Frederick Valentich, a 20 year old private pilot from Melbourne, Australia. Valentich was traveling across the strait on October the 21st, when just after 7 p.m., he radioed Melbourne Flight Service with a strange transmission claiming he was being followed by an unidentified aircraft. After Valentich had failed to arrive in King Island, a distress phase was declared and an intensive search of air, sea and land was conducted. The search provided no results. His intentions were to fly to King Island, not far from Tasmania, and a 45 minute flight from his departure in Melbourne's Moorabbin. Although Valentich did not declare his intended arrival to King Island Airport, which was against standard procedures. Another interesting point is that he told two different and conflicting reasons for his flight to King Island, but more on that later. So what was Frederick Valentich's flight intentions? Was he really being followed by an aircraft? Was it a UFO? Or was it a clever hoax? Frederick Valentich was a young trainee pilot from Melbourne, Australia. Born to parents Guido and Alberta Valentich, he was the eldest of four children one younger brother Robert, and twin sisters Olivia and Lara. Frederick, or Fred as he was known, had a love of aviation and longed to become a commercial pilot. He unsuccessfully applied to enlist in the Royal Australian Air Force twice, but both times was rejected due to a lack of qualifications. This did not deter the young man and he became a member of the RAF Air Training Corps, determined to have a career in aviation. Desperately wanting to become a commercial pilot, Valentich was studying part-time Unfortunately, this came with a few rejections also. Fred failed commercial license and examination subjects a number of times, and recently before his disappearance, was given a warning for straying into a controlled zone in Sydney, and twice was reprimanded for flying into clouds blindly, the latter for which was being considered a disciplinary action. Not only did Fred have a passion for aircraft, but he also had a fascination for UFOs and aliens, as later stated by his father Guido. He reportedly said that his son was constantly afraid that he would be attacked by UFOs. According to the Aircraft Incident Investigation Report made by the Department of Transport, Frederick had obtained a Class 4 instrument rating earlier in 1978, which allowed him to operate at night in Visual Meteorological Conditions, or VMC for short, and had approximately 150 hours of flight time on the night he vanished. On Saturday, October the 21st, 1978, Valentich attended the Morabin briefing office where he hired a Cessna 182 aircraft and obtained a meteorological briefing and at 5.23 p.m. he submitted a flight plan for a night VMC flight from Morabin to King Island and return. The proposed altitude for the flight was below 5,000 feet with estimated time intervals of 41 minutes to Cape Otway and 28 minutes from the Cape to King Island. Valentich told his father he was intending to go to King Island for some crayfish. However, he made his intentions different when reporting it to Melbourne Southern Air Services, stating he was uplifting friends on King Island and promptly took four life jackets with him. As indicated by a later report made by the Department of Transport, Valentich did not make any arrangements for the illumination at the King Island Aerodrome. The Cessna was refuelled to capacity at 6.10pm and had enough fuel to last 300 minutes. Valentich then departed from Morabin at 6.19 p.m. He established two-way radio contact with Melbourne Flight Service Unit, or FSU for short, and reported Cape Otway at 7 p.m. Six minutes later, FSU received another line of communication from the Cessna registered VHDSJ. The following recording is a little hard to hear, but I've done my best to clean up the audio. <laughs> Melbourne, 
There is no further recorded contact with Valentich after this. What you heard at the end of the transmission was what some have described as a metallic scraping noise. The air traffic controller at FSU that night was Steve Roby, who later told newspaper the Sydney Morning Herald that he had no idea what happened to Valentich that night in October of 1978, but he did remark of his apparent distress. He had obviously seen something that clearly frightened him. Whatever the case, Valentich and the Cessna 182 registered as VHDSJ were never seen again. The weather in the Cape Otway area that night was clear with a trace of stratocumulus cloud at 5,000 to 7,000 feet, scattered cirrus clouds at 30,000 feet, excellent visibility and light winds. The end of daylight at Cape Otway was at 7.18 p.m. The alert phase of SAR procedures was declared at 7.12 p.m. and at 7.33 p.m. when the aircraft did not arrive at King Island. The distress phase was declared and search action was commenced. A sea and air search was undertaken that included an ocean-going ship traffic and RAF Lockhead P-3 Orion aircraft, plus eight civilian aircraft. The search encompassed over 1,000 square miles. The intensive air, sea and land search was continued until the 25th of October 1978, but no trace of the aircraft or indication of a crash site was found. Valentich's last proposed coordinates are 39 degrees and 24 minutes south, 143 degrees and 45 minutes east. You can find them on the bottom of this screen. An investigation was conducted by the Department of Transport looking into the disappearance of Valentich and the rented Cessna plane. In the report, there are numerous letters back and forth between different government departments. Five years after the disappearance in 1982, a finding of what appeared to be an engine cow flap belonging to a Cessna 182 on Flinders Island. The cow flap was then sent to New South Wales to be analysed by the RAN Research Laboratory. Their report states, The part has been identified as having come from a Cessna 182 aircraft between a certain range of serial numbers. The part is an engine cow flap for the control or airflow over the engine. It is 300 millimetres long by 200 millimetres wide and 400 millimetres at its deepest point. It has two side panels when first found. The piece was once white acrylic paint and is made of aluminium composition, now greatly eroded. The operating bolt of steel, while heavily corroded, appears to have failed on impact or in flight, i.e. not by corrosion. While investigating the strange case, the Department of Transport spoke to a number of acquaintances and family members about his intentions to fly to King Island. All of them stated that Valentich wanted to purchase crayfish. However, he told the operator and the Moorabbin briefing officer that the purpose of the flight was to bring back passengers. The department investigators found that there were no passengers waiting to be picked up from King Island. Furthermore, there were no orders placed for crayfish at King Island prior to his flight, and even if he did, there was no crayfish available on King Island at the time. The report concluded that Frederick Valentich may have not even intended to fly to King Island due to the lack of evidence. They stated in their conclusion, had the flight proceeded as planned and the aircraft did crash into the ocean, it is most probable that wreckage would have been sighted. The aircraft disappeared without a trace and no wreckage was located or information received concerning the whereabouts of the aircraft and its occupant. It therefore is not possible to determine the cause of the disappearance, but it seems likely that the aircraft did not crash in the sea between Cape Otway and King Island. So if the plane did not crash, then what really happened to Frederick Valentich? Addressing the big elephant in the room, the first theory is, of course, the UFO. According to his radio call, Valentich was being chased by an unidentifiable aircraft with four bright lights. The end of the transmission is followed by an unidentifiable noise that some have thought to be metallic scraping sounds. After the media got a hold of this information, there was widespread national and international reports from various media outlets that perpetuated and may have even exaggerated these claims. More than a dozen witnesses came forward with reports of bright lights and UFO phenomena over the Bass Strait on the night Valentich disappeared. Some people described the object as brilliantly lit, oblong in shape, and moving quickly. The most credible of these witnesses was an amateur photographer by the name of Roy Manifold, 
who produced a photograph taken 20 minutes before Valentich flew over the strait. The photo in question is of the ocean view at Cape Otway, and what can be seen in the photo is a strange object in the upper right-hand corner of the frame. At first, Manifold believed that this was a developing error. However, a photo examiner found no dirt or damage on the negative. The strange mark was determined to be in the photograph. American photo analysts were determined that it was a metallic object, apparently in a cloud of exhaust. It was apparently a mile from the camera. The Kodak lab in Coburg studied the negative and reported no problem with the emulsion or the development of the negative. Interestingly, the Bureau of Air Safety entertained the idea of a UFO to be one of the many probable causes of Valentich's disappearance. Theory two is that he simply crashed. Using the Occam's razor, in which is the problem-solving principle that recommends searching for explanations constructed with the smallest possible set of elements. Basically, if you hear hoofsteps, think horses, not zebras, then this theory would be most likely Valentich simply crashed into the Bass Strait. But if this happened, then why was there no wreck site found? The Bass Strait is notorious for having very rough waters, often choppy with an average depth of 60 metres. If the plane did crash into the ocean, then one theory is that the wreckage may have washed up elsewhere from its proposed crash site coordinates. As with the finding of the Cal engine flap on Flinders Island, a large distance away from his last coordinates, then it is likely that if he crashed into the Bass Strait, then the wreckage could have been carried off far from the search area. However, to facilitate this theory, one needs to consider the weight of a Cessna 182 light aircraft and the currents of the Bass Strait on the exact night he supposedly crashed. A typical Cessna light aircraft weighs about 1,400 kilos, or 3,100 pounds, and according to the Bureau of Air Safety Investigations report, showed unusually large currents on Julian Day 81, 1983, that resulted in a storm, and again on Julian Day 96. They proposed that it was likely that wreckage parts could have been washed ashore from the eastern part of Bass Strait. Could it be possible that the wreck was missed when the search aircraft was flying overhead? We do have to remember the time and daylight hours in which sunset was recorded at 7.18pm on Saturday, the 21st of October 1978, five minutes after Valentich's last recorded transmission. The alert phase of the SAR procedure wasn't administered until 7.33pm, a further 15 minutes. Given the time it would take for a search plane to respond, it would seem plausible that by the time searches reached the established area, the lack of light would be a hindrance to operations. Given the amount of fuel, it would appear unlikely that the plane's engine ran out. Could a mechanical or engine failure be the culprit? In the recording, a metallic sound can be heard, described like metal on metal. Some have suggested that this could possibly be pistons in the engine misfiring. Well, according to the investigation, the plane was flown previously that morning and inspected and no faults were found. However, some have also suggested that this could be due to the plane flying upside down, if it was, and doing so for an extended period of time. This would cause gravity to act upon the fuel in a way that would keep it from reaching the engine, in effect causing the pistons to misfire. Combustion engines like the Cessna were not designed to be flown upside down for an extended period of time. But why would Valentich fly upside down? Had he became distracted by the unknown aircraft he claims he saw? Or simply, did he become disorientated and what he thought he saw was really his own reflection on the ocean's surface? And if he did, could he see it from the altitude of 4,500 feet? The third theory is that Valentich faked his death. But if he did, then for what possible reason? Investigators found no mention of any change in behaviour and spoke to numerous people who knew him, including his girlfriend. They all stated he was in a good mood and made no mention of any issues or problems. Furthermore, they investigated the theory that he may have disappeared to avoid a debt, but again, there was no evidence of this. In fact, his father Guido was financing his flight training and made mention of his generosity at birthdays and Christmases. For whatever reason, could it be possible that Valentich flew off course to somewhere else. All we know is that the plane and Valentich were never found. Frederick's father later became involved with UFOologists and believed his son had either been attacked or abducted mid-flight. Richard Haynes, an American research scientist at NASA, who after retirement began to research UFO interaction 
with military and civilian aircraft, was one of those who examined the case of Valentich's disappearance and believed there might have been a possible cause for extraterrestrial involvement. As of the date of recording this episode, it's now been 45 years since Frederick Valentich was last seen. A plaque at Cape Otway Lighthouse now commemorates his disappearance. But what are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to see one of your comments right here, then start a comment with Shadow Shoutout. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more content like this and click that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest episodes. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter. Happy Halloween. <laughs>